Okay, good evening. Welcome. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, hopefully this month we have better luck with Zoom. I know that we looked, I looked at the participants. Um, we have a number of Woody's uh, friends who are familiar with Dr. Shore. Uh, we even have uh, Father Chris Corbelly on uh, from last month. Hopefully our Zoom does better uh, technology-wise than we did uh, last month. Let's give it a try. Why aren't you paging down? Let's try that. Welcome to the meeting. So, uh, general business announcements. We have a short member presentation from Steve Bradshaw. And then our speaker tonight is Dr. Stephen Neil Shore, who is coming to us all the way from Padua, Italy, and our Pisa, Italy, uh, where it's five in the morning. So we're gonna be, we're gonna try to get through everything as quickly as possible. Uh, officers and board, myself, Woody, James Yoder over here, treasurer is Brooks in the back. So if you need badges or anything, talk to him. Our uh, board members, if you could just wave, Don Wrigley is here, uh, Dave Kosho is here, Tom, Steve Bradshaw, uh, Alex Beck is the only one, he's in California. Uh, property director, Marty is our webmaster. And do we have any visitors tonight? All right, can you just, uh, talk to us and yell. I'm gonna to try to relay a little bit of this because we don't have a mic on you. Uh, what's your name, sir? Dan. Dan, and where are you from, Dan? Casa Grand. Casa Grand. All right, well, welcome. And Joey. Joey, and Joey is one of our uh, youth volunteers at the observatory where we were closed down tonight for clouds, but nice, Joey Green. Uh, yes, down front. And your first name? Dennis, Dennis in Mesa, thank you. A uh, new member, all right. Anybody else? Yes. New member and another Dennis. That's it, Dennis squared. All right, and next, Jim Armstrong, Tim P, thank you. And James East Mesa and Manum. Beth from Scottsdale and anybody else? Yes, sir. Jack from Mesa. Listen, we're glad you're here. We really appreciate it. We are very, very delighted to have uh, visitors at any point in time. Uh, join or renew your membership. Also a badge pitch, pick up. Uh, it's down to maybe what, three boxes or something? I, no, pick up the stinking badges. All right, Greco, uh, just a short note, you may not have heard of it, uh, Gordon Rosner, uh, the assistant manager, unfortunately, he was riding his motorcycle and he had a hit and run accident where the guy left. Uh, the bike's okay. He has five broken ribs. He's back home doing better, but uh, keep him in mind, this is not fun. And if you know of anybody who has serious damage to their car that looks like they hit a motorcycle, let us know. Um, and... There we go, Steve, we're gonna do you. Anyway, um, about uh, six weeks ago, I was reading an article in Sky and Telescope magazine and they mentioned the Roche limit. Most of us probably know what it is. We've all read the serviceable one, one line definition of it. And that was good enough. But after I read the article, I thought, hmm, I'd like to know actually more about the Roche limit. So I started doing some research and they're always asking for member presentations. So I thought, hey, I'll turn my research into a member presentation. So I'm gonna talk about the Roche limit. It's actually has some alternate names, as you can see on the slide there, sometimes called the Roche radius or the tidal radius. So we're gonna get into it and just uh, kind of take a look at things. Now it's almost impossible to talk about the Roche limit without mentioning Saturn. And so why is, why is Saturn so, uh, so, so tied with the Roche limit? It's because Saturn is pretty much hands down the kind of the poster child, the visual poster child for the Roche limit. And so let's take a look at a uh, picture of Saturn there. Over here, of course, we see the planet itself and then orbiting sort of nearby would be the rings. So they're orbiting close by. And then as we move out from the rings, of course, we have all the moons coming out sort of this direction. And in general, this is kind of true. It's not entirely true, which we'll see why and so I get further into the presentation. But pretty much from that point that I have there in the little arrow going back towards Saturn, you have no moons. Whereas from that same point going out, you have moons. So why is that? Well, turns out there's a boundary right there. And you know, what's happening right here that's results from no moons to moons? 
And what's happening there is the Roche limit. That's where the Roche limit is. So you have rings on one side, moons on the other. Why is that so? So let's talk about that for a little bit. So what is the Roche limit? Well, we're all gonna see the little text-based one, one line definition. You can all read it together almost. You know, the Roche limit, as you can see, there's the minimum distance at which a sa small satellite body can orbit a much larger primary body uh, without being tor torn apart by gravitational tidal forces. Now, if you're familiar with tidal forces, great. If you're not, don't worry about it. I have one slide on tidal forces coming up a little bit later on because that is important. But beyond this sort of text-based definition, we can have a couple of graphics here as well. So here we've got, of course, the Earth, and it's exerting, exerting tidal forces on the moon, just like the moon exerts tidal forces back on the Earth. But as long as this moon, the point is, as long as the moon remains outside that Roche limit, it's going to remain intact. It's going to look like a moon, and that's where it sits, and it's been sitting there for you know millennia at this point. However, if during, let's say, the zombie apocalypse or the alien invasion or whatever happens, and the moon gets pulled in beside the Roche limit, uh, the moon would literally be shredded, torn apart, and we'd end up with a ring system somewhat like Saturn. So this is kind of what the Roche limit is. We're going to look at some details beyond this as we go through the presentation. Um, I could finish this up by saying, look at, by those last couple of pieces of text there. So if you're inside the Roche limit, it's really kind of features destruction in there. Big things become small things once, once you hit the Roche limit. Whereas if you're outside the Roche limit, small things can, can become big things. So you can have accretion and you know dust particles begin to cling and you get bigger and bigger dust particles, then they become rocks and they become moons and so forth and so on. So this is kind of where the Roche limit is, what the Roche limit is doing. Now let's look at some details here. Uh, first of all, who discovered the Roche limit? It's kind of like asking who's buried in Grant's tomb. Um, I don't know, Grant. Well, who discovered the Roche limit? Uh, well, I'm guessing probably a guy named Roche, and sure enough, a guy named Roche. So back in 1848, there was this uh, French astronomer and mathematician, and he figured out the, the, the theory and the equations and all that for the Roche limit. So that is the, that's where it came from. And his theory and equations have been used really for kind of two main purposes. Now, on the historical side, they've mostly been sort of used to analyze and explain Saturn's ring system. Why are the rings inside and moons outside? So the equations sort of explain all that. But more recently, um, I'm going to sort of guesstimate around from 2000 on, um, they've been used to help understand uh, exoplanet formation around, you know, protostars and things like that. So a little bit, we're extending our knowledge of what's in our own solar system to other solar systems out there. So that's kind of a little bit about the Roche limit. To really understand kind of more details about the Roche limit though, really uh, requires us to have um, uh, uh, kind of a basic, at least, understanding of something called universal gravitation and tidal forces. So on this slide, I'm gonna talk about universal gravitation, really high level. Uh, the final bullet item on this slide will introduce the tidal force, and then the next slide is gonna be about tidal forces. So this is where we're heading. So anyway, Newton, of course, did a lot of work with gravity. Uh, we're going to sort of ignore, ignore Einsteinian gravity for right now. We're just going to stick with Newtonian gravity. But uh, Newton's uh, uh, universal law or law of universal gravitation states that really every particle of mass is attracting every other particle of mass. So right now, my body is being gravitationally attracted to this podium and vice versa. The podium is being attracted to me. And it's universal. Everything attracts everything else. I'm being attracted to the door back there. That door is being attracted to me. Now, why am I not racing towards the door to cling to it? Because the Earth's holding us all down because we're all attracted to the Earth, and it's kind of got the this, this stronger force. Um, the amount of gravitational force is going to be approximated by a formula. And so here's the formula. Um, good thing is we don't have to solve it. We just have to understand sort of the format of it. So there's the formula. We have the force of gravity is proportional to the mass of the first body times the mass of the second body, sort of divided by the distance between them squared. And uh, the formula's format actually tells us some really interesting things, though, about how this is working. So the, this formula's format is going to tell us that gravitational force is, first of all, uh, directly proportional to the mass of the objects. So um, um, I've tried to do this for the people that the camera can see me as well uh, that are on Zoom. But if my two hands represent mass and, and a gravitational force, directly proportional means they go up and down together. You get more mass, you get more force. You get less mass, you get less force. They go up and down together. But this formula also tells us that gravitational force is indirectly proportional to the distance. And so here you get more of a um, teeter-totter effect. 
If one goes up, the other one's going down and vice versa. So if you get more distance, you get less force. You get more distance, uh, you get less force. You get less distance, you get more force. They work in opposite ways. This is what this is all about. And um, notice that the force is actually going to drop off sort of exponentially. It's a d squared in that formula. So the force is going to drop off exponentially with, with distance, but it never goes to zero, which is kind of an interesting thing. Those, uh, those far off galaxies that we're seeing pictures from, from James Webb, theoretically, we're feeling their gravity. It's so infinitesimally small as to be unmeasurable, but theoretically, law of universal gravity, we're feeling attraction there. Now, it's this distance and the idea that the further away, the less force you feel and the closer you are, the more force you feel is what is this then tidal force, which we're gonna introduce now. So tidal force is a result of gravity having different strengths at different distances. All right, that's all it is, different strengths at different distances. So let's look at the next slide and then we're gonna see a little bit more about tidal force, but we're gonna illustrate it sort of graphically here. So uh, here we have uh, objects A and B, they're really just orbiting the Earth, okay? A couple hypothetical objects. So here's A, and it's of course orbiting the Earth closer in. Object B is a little further out in its orbit, orbiting further out. And the net effect of this is that A, feeling more gravity, is gonna orbit a little more quickly. It's gonna move faster through space. And B, conversely, since it's feeling less gravity, is going to actually end up uh, orbiting a little bit slower out there. And so A is always going to be pulling ahead of B, and eventually it'll catch up to B and pass it, and it'll just keep doing that over and over again. Now, A and B are going to be fine doing this because they're separate objects and they move at different, different speeds. The problem is, this is where you have not two separate objects, but one maybe larger object. So here I'm going to draw the moon in just a moment, but the tidal force, remember, is the difference in gravitational force between two points. So here's my two points. Let's say we have a zombie apocalypse. The moon's now been sucked into the Roche limit, okay? If we look at point A on the moon, it's the closest to the Earth. It's the near side, it's feeling the most force, okay? B being on the other side is feeling less force. And what happens is A wants to move faster and B wants to slow down. And so you get a sort of a shearing effect. And if you let that go on long enough, eventually it rips the moon apart. And this is what gives us our ring system and Saturn. All those are just a bunch of debris from probably things that have been ripped apart because all those rings are inside the Roche limit in Saturn. So anyway, this is the idea of what tidal force is. It's a shearing or tearing effect that tears things apart and it happens at the Roche limit is what it's doing here. Anyway, um, the Roche limit now, that we have some basics down, is actually not a sharp boundary. It's not a one size fits all, all right? So let's take a look at some things here for just a moment. Um, uh, hang on, I lost my button. Okay, different, uh, different satellite objects and have different Roche limits depending upon four different things. The mass of both bodies, the composition of the satellite object, you know, how dense, what's it made of, is it fluid, is it rock, whatever. Uh, the size of the satellite can have an effect on how it deals with the Roche limit. And then actually spin of the object as well. If the satellite is spinning. Now, spin has really nothing to do with Roche, but it actually can en enhance or affect how the Roche limit is affecting the moon. So that's all that is. So anyway, uh, we are going to cover all four of these features over the next four slides. And then we have a fifth slide on with some, a couple of equations and then we're done. All right. So obviously I'm gonna do four diagrams here, or it's a really boring game of tic-tac-toe, whichever you wanna look at. But anyway, so mass and the Roche limit, how is it effective? Well, it really depends on the mass of not only the primary body, the, the planet, the, the star, whatever is being orbited, and then the things orbiting it. So let's look at the thing, the primary object first. So once again, Roche is, the Roche limit is the equilibrium point between gravity's tidal and cohesion forces. And we're gonna see that illustrated in some of these diagrams. So here I've drawn the Earth with the moon once again. I've, and uh, notice I, I put a little label here. It says there's less mass. Well, less mass than what? Well, my next example is going to be Jupiter. So it's going to be a more massive object compared to a less massive object. So anyway, there's the Earth. It's a less massive object. And we have a moon out there, as you can see. And uh, because uh, the smaller mass of the Earth is going to generate less tidal force, that means there's going to be less tidal force on this moon than there would be, let's say, if it was Jupiter or Saturn or a large body or the sun or some other star. And the net effect of the primary body having less mass is it's going to sort of decrease the diameter of the Roche limit. So this moon could approach this Earth much more closely before it's going to be torn apart is what that means. 
it's the net effect of decrease, decreasing that. If we compared that to, let's say, a Jupiter, which has a lot more gravity, a lot more mass, a lot more tidal force, that has the effect of sort of increasing the diameter of the Roche limit. So this moon, which is actually our Earth's moon, I just got lazy in my graphics, this moon cannot approach nearly as close to Jupiter before it starts to be torn apart by those tidal forces, the greater tidal forces. But it's not just the mass of the primary. Now the primary has the blind share of setting where the Roche limit is. But the, the satellite object itself has the negligible but measurable effect of setting where the Roche limit is. So anyway, here's a Jupiter again, and we have a, sort of a, a large mass moon. Because it has a lot of mass, it, it generates a fair amount of gravity, and that gravity forms a cohesive force. It wants to hold that moon together longer. And so that has, the, once again, the effect of sort of decreasing the diameter of the Roche limit just a little bit. So this moon can approach the planet a little bit more closely before it starts to get ripped up. If we compare that to, let's say, a smaller moon with a smaller mass, well, that has less gravity, less cohesive force, and it sort of increases the diameter of the Roche limit. If that moon moves in, it's going to get ripped apart much more quickly. So this is kind of how mass of, of the satellite and the primary are affecting where the Roche limit is. Now, the lion's share is going to be on the primary side because it has most of the mass, but there's going to be a little bit of wiggle room depending on the mass of the, of the, sec, of the satellite object. Okay, So that's mass. Next one is satellite composition and the Roche limit. So um, the Roche limit is applicable only, first of all, the Roche limit is applicable only to bodies that are bound solely by gravitational bonds, not chemical bonds. And we're going to have three examples here, pictures in just a moment. But um, once again, chemical bonds are a result of the physics force of electromagnetism. And electromagnetism is many, 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 many times stronger than gravity. So if things are held together chemically through electromagnetism, they're just not going to be that subject to the Roche limit at all. Whereas if they're sort of just loosely bound by gravity, the Roche limit has a dramatic effect on them, all right? So uh, all this is gonna result in different Roche limits for fluid objects versus like semi-rigid objects versus rigid body objects, things like that. So I have three examples here. Um, you might recognize that photo. It's the uh, Shoemaker-Levy nine, uh, 9 comet that crashed into Jupiter a number of years back. And that was one comet when it approached, but the tidal Roche limit, the tidal forces at the Roche limit ripped it apart. And here it was like nine objects by the time it finally crashed into Jupiter. And that was a fluid body and it broke up pretty early as a result, okay? Because it's just an icy comet, mostly fluid. Um, another example might be like a rubble pile meteor, a meteor, uh, a meteorite or meteor, I should say. So anyway, it's just a rubble pile um, it's mostly held together by gravity, and once again, uh, it's going to result in a little bit larger Roche limit because it's going to get ripped up a little bit sooner. If we compare that, though, to, let's say, an iron meteorite that's basically held together with strong chemical bonds, there really almost is little to no Roche limit that's ever going to affect that. In fact, it would just crash right into the Earth if it was aimed at us, because it would burn up a little bit in the atmosphere, but that would have nothing to do with the Roche limit. So the composition of the satellite can affect where that Roche limit ends up a little bit as well. Um, the satellite size also affects the Roche limit, so just so you know. So artificial and natural satellites smaller than about a kilometer in size are more likely to survive intact as they cross over the Roche limit. And the reason for that, we ask why, is because the gravitational force on such a small object is going to be nearly the same on the near and far sides of that object. So there's not a lot of tidal force. There's not that shearing, tearing effect. It's just not big enough. The force is about equal on both sides of the object. So I have a couple of examples there. There's like one of the space station, obviously it's smaller than a kilometer. And so it's not really subject to the tidal forces. So it's not really acting on it. And so it flies inside the Roche limit all day long. That, it wouldn't matter anyway, it's chemical bonds. So that's all it is, it wouldn't matter anyway. Um, the other picture there, I had to actually add a description for that. Otherwise you had, would have no idea what that is, but out of the F ring on Saturn is about where the Roche limit is for Saturn. And that's actually a little moonlet that's being created out there. It's accreting together. And it's so small that there's no tidal forces or not enough anyway to tear it apart. But if it keeps growing long enough, eventually it'll be destroyed as it'll start getting tight, it'll be subject to tidal forces, that shearing tearing effect, and it'll rip it apart over time. So once again, the satellite size can affect how it deals with the Roche limit, okay, when it reaches it. 
And then lastly will be spin. Uh, once again, this really has nothing to do with Roche, but it, it kind of plays into the whole, what happens if you cross the Roche boundary. And so here's the idea of this. Spin creates an additional centrifugal force that helps tear apart uh, a satellite. So here we have a large tidal force coming in from the left. Uh, we've got a moon there that's spinning. There's a near side and a far side, and there's a difference in gravitation at those two points. And so if it crossed the Roche limit, the near side would want to start breaking up a little bit. It would want to have that shearing effect. Well, this spinning action, though, is going to actually sort of enhance that by creating an additional centrifugal force. And between the centrifugal force and the tidal force, this object might be ripped up a little bit more quickly, just because it has spin in addition to being near the Roche or past the Roche limit. So that's the idea of spin. And uh, we want to get on to our guests. So this is the final slide for this particular one. There are different equations for the Roche limit. And so we're going to look at them in just a moment. So there are separate Roche equations for what they call rigid satellite bodies or fluid satellite bodies. And this you know, came from, from our man Edward Roche uh, almost 200 years ago now. The result, though, is that you're going to have different Roche radii for different satellite compositions. So think about Saturn has you know, how many dozens of moons and Jupiter has dozens of moons. Well, just Jupiter has a Roche limit, Saturn has a Roche limit, but it's going to slightly vary a little bit depending on which satellite, which moon you're looking at. Because the moon is a player in there as well. And we'll see that in the formulas. So there are the two formulas, one for rigid satellite bodies and the other one for fluid satellite bodies. The biggest difference here is this little multiplier right here, 1.44 versus 2.4 over here. And this 1.4 multiplier here results, is going to result in a smaller Roche radius, where this larger multiplier of 2.4 over here is going to result in a slightly larger Roche radius. But what do all those other things mean? And by the way, these are not P's here. Those are the Greek Rho characters. So it's Rho, capital M, Rho, lowercase m. So those aren't P's. Anyway, if we kind of do this and add the rest of this, here is sort of the definition of all the variables. But here they are illustrated over here. So radius R is the radius of the primary body. So that's up here, but we're multiplying time that little multiplier. The D is what we're trying to figure out in this equation. That's the distance from the center of the primary out to the Roche limit, which is set right here, okay? But, and then notice this P, uh, rho, excuse me, I'd say P, rho M or rho lowercase m over here, that has to do with the density of those two bodies. And that actually plugs in here, and this little, plugging in the densities of the two bodies we're looking at, that actually creates just a little bit of wiggle room as to where that Roche radius actually is. So the multiplier kind of sets the base of where we are going to sort of establish the Roche limit, but then we'll have a little side to side wiggle room there based on the density of the two objects themselves. And so notice that other than the 1.4 and the 2.4, these, these are identical, um, identical equations pretty much. And that is kind of the simple, real simple little concept, but kind of fun to look at. And I want to thank you, and we'll get on to our presenter. Okay. 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 Um, let's see where we are down here. Let's do yours. Let's go back up to here. Let's go to there. You should be in business and you can just push down. Good evening, everyone. My name is Woody Sims. I am your club VP. Can you hear me? Can they hear me on Zoom? Yeah. Ah, excellent, excellent. Uh, Steve, great job on that presentation. That would look like a lot of work. Well done. Uh, now I'd like to introduce my, my friend, Dr. Stephen Neil Shore, Professor Stephen Neil Shore. He is a professor of physics at the University of Pisa. You might guess that he's fluent in English, but he's actually fluent in Italian also. Steve got his Master of Science degree in Earth and Space Sciences at Stony Brook University. He got his PhD in astronomy at the University of Toronto. Um, he was uh, in, at the university at the same time that our speaker, Father Dr. Uh, Chris Corbally was uh, at, uh, who was our speaker last month. Um, 
Steve's been there 20 years now at the University of Pisa. Prior to that, for about 10 years, he was professor and department chair of the physics and astronomy department in Indiana University. Steve has over 317 refereed publications as of sometime last year, uh, and he's working on more. Over 350 conference and non-journal papers. He's the Associate Scientific Editor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and you can see that's been for 20 years. Steve has been an Editor-in-Chief of Astrophysics and Space Science Library. There's a whole list of these. Steve would be embarrassed if I, well, he's probably already embarrassed. Uh, but uh, Steve is a great friend of the Small Telescope Scientists, and part of uh, what he does there that helps us out is with the AAVSO. He's the leader of the spectroscopy section. And um, some of his research topics of interest are astrophysical hydrodynamics and spectroscopy. And, and that's how I know Steve is through the spectroscopy side of things and stars that blow up. I published this uh, title to Steve's talk, Classical Novae Has Thermonuclear Explosions, Cosmic Sources Violating the Test Ban Treaty. Interesting title for a talk. I won't read the abstract, but I've got it on here for people that want to see this later uh, on Zoom. They'll have a chance to reread this. Because you don't get to see Steve here in person, I thought I ought to at least give you a, a, a glimpse and a little bit more opportunity to, to uh, see and know Steve. Uh, all right, that's Steve Shore. Uh, that's not Steve Shore. And uh, this is part of our gang. We met in uh, Provence uh, at a meeting there at OHP. Uh, this is Francois Cochard, uh, CEO of Shelliac Instruments. Francois Tessier, who runs the ARAS organization in France. Dr. David Boyd is the former president of the British Astronomy Association. And Paul Lucas uh, with the camel there, I won't tell you what's on the back of his shirt. He runs the uh, observatories and astronomy outreach at the University of Southwestern Australia in Perth. And uh, so this is a pretty, pretty fun gang to have the opportunity to be associated with. But back to Steve, this is Steve's blackboard, at least uh, as it was when I saw it. And, uh, pointed out here that that looks like real chalk, uh, none of this whiteboard stuff. And uh, this here, that's the eraser. And I learned that I'm, he's quicker with that eraser than I am with my camera to take snapshots of what he's trying to explain to me on the board. Oh, are you embarrassed, Steve? <laughs> All right, and then yes. I thought to give you one more idea, Steve reminds me uh, a lot of uh, Richard Feynman and uh, Richard Feynman was kind of a jokester and, and did a lot of interesting things and thought about things in ways maybe differently than, than I would. Steve, being at the University of Pisa, uh, it only seemed natural to, and, and the home of Galileo. In fact, I've seen the home uh, Steve showed me where Galileo lived when he lived in Pisa. But uh, Steve repeated Galileo's gravity experiment by dropping objects of uh, different masses from the top of the uh, tower. And uh, I'll provide a link uh, when we send out the, uh, the video after this meeting uh, to the YouTube video where you can see this short video. It's, it's pretty fun. There were a lot of people there dressed in costume as if they were in Galileo's time. And, and Steve is the character that's up on top dropping off objects of different masses. And what do you think? Do you think they hit the ground at the same time or not? Oh man, you guys are supposed to be astronomers. All right, so let's, uh, let's somehow give uh, Dr. Stephen Neil Shore a big round of applause and- Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's, it's nice to know people who uh, appreciate what we do after dark. Uh, I, I always try to explain to my students that the, my, my normal hours are the same as, as a vampire, and this, this will have to end when I have to return to the earth in which I was buried. But otherwise, um, since they're interesting and, and also, it's actually related to the previous talk. Uh, what I wanted to go through is a test example of how you do real-time astronomy, how you have some of the techniques that 
you have to apply to understand something that's actually a very simple phenomenon, namely an explosive ejection of mass from a star. But let, let me set it up because um, I'm actually supposed to be a theorist and set this up in a way that is going to require that I use a, uh, an, another screen. So let me stop the um, screen share for a moment. Okay, you can still see the screen? Okay, because what I'd like to do is start out with uh, the, the only way I know how to, how to do things, which is, which is teaching with cartoons. Um, imagine that you have two deformable objects, otherwise called stars, that find themselves as, as kind of cohabiting adults in the same system and they're orbiting a common center of mass. If they're very far apart, then you merely have distortion of the star because of tides. And effectively what that means to amplify the, the discussion of the Roche limit is that if you imagine that you have a body, so we'll take just a simple case where you have a finite sized object that's orbiting a center of mass with something else. And it doesn't really matter how massive that is. Steve, this can you is, hear me? Yes. Uh, if you're sharing your other screen, we are not seeing it. Oh, okay. Um, now, are you seeing it? We still see the explosive screen. Okay, here. Ah, I see. I have to change screens. Now you got it? Yes. Yes. Now we do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about this. After you, know, you would think after three years of pandemic, this would be second nature, but it, it never really is. So you've got these two bodies in orbit around each other. And the fact that this is self gravitating means that if the other object weren't there, it would just be spherically symmetric unless it was rotating sufficiently quickly that that would actually be something distorting the object. But if you imagine that in orbit, it isn't simply that it's being ripped apart, it's that different portions of this body are orbiting relative to the center with different angular momenta. And so in an orbit, if they're kept together by gravity, one side of this body is actually orbiting more slowly than it should be. And the other part is orbiting more rapidly than it should be for that distance. That is, it has more angular momentum and this side has less angular momentum. And the result, because of the nature of gravity, is that one side relative to the center feels an acceleration inward, and the other side feels an acceleration outward. And that's the reason why a tide produces this weird distortion that it's not simply that you're ripping the body apart, it's that this translates into something like this. And if you take this to be the distorted surface, for example, of the atmosphere or the oceans, because they're not rigid, they're, they're classic fluids, then if you've got the earth rotating, the, any point on the earth feels a tidal variation twice a day. And so you go through too high and too low tides because of the change in the pressure and the change in the height of the oceans. Okay, now this is important because if you take a star in equilibrium, a body has two things that are opposing if it's, if it's stellar, if it's massive enough. One is an outward gradient in the pressure, 
that is the pressure is higher in the center. And the other is the sheer weight of the overlying layers. And these two are counterbalancing each other. If you neglect rotation, it's gonna be spherical. But if you put something in the way, in other words, if it starts to distort like this, having two stars that are close enough to each other begins distorting both of them. The larger one will distort more because it's simply more extended, okay? It has the wrong angular momentum even more than a more compact body. And the result of that is that if they're close enough, instead of being a mere distortion that's symmetric, the body starts to distort now in a way that approaches an equilibrium point here where the gravity of this body is equal to the attraction from the companion. The result here is that because you've got the pressure inside, this thing basically acts like a balloon, okay? There's virtually nothing out here. You know, space is empty, but on this side, there's a pressure gradient because you have the whole mass of the star. And normally that would be decreasing at the surface, but here it goes through the point where there is literally no net gravitational force. And so instead of simply drifting, it's actually forced through by this pressure gradient and begins launching toward the other star. This isn't a binary. It's going to go not directly toward that object, but it's going to feel another acceleration because in this system, it's starting out with some, again, net angular momentum. You're giving it the equivalent of an initial orbit. And so if the system is orbiting around a center of mass, which might be somewhere between the stars, this, instead of going into a direct shot, toward the companion, deviates, circulates, slams into itself at velocities that are supersonic, forms a shock and forms a disk that eventually accumulates mass on the other object. And this is the process of mass transfer that happens if you've got a binary system. It doesn't inevitably happen because if the system is initially wide enough, neither star may exceed this critical size and this Roche surface. But if they're close enough together in the course of evolution, the more massive the star hits that. <laughs> and the resulting stream, the resulting mass transfer has to in part just get blown out of the system. I and mean, this is not a, this is not a pretty process. It's not a nice, clean, flushed toilet here. It's that material is blown all over the place, but in addition, it's also gravitationally bound. And so you get a disk of gas formed that's viscous and essentially like you, an analogy with what happens in a drain. This slowly drifts in on a time scale that depends on how viscous it is, how much internal friction it has, and it accumulates on the central object, the thing that's sitting in the center of the disk. And this works beautifully for forming protoplanets. And it's the same thing that's responsible for binaries like Algol, where one of the stars has evolved into the red giant phase the system's got a period of a couple of days, and that means they're close enough and both massive enough that one of the stars is losing mass onto the other and forming this accretion disk. So far, okay? So if, if this is, um, so let me go now to, you know, back to the screen share here, okay? So we're back here. 
Yes, Steve, we see the explosive on our front page. Okay, um, I need to move this bar. Okay, let's go back to play. So, Perfect. the relevance here is that you can think of this as either a slow accumulation of mass on the other star, if that's a normal star. And if it were a star like the sun that had a slightly more massive companion, then that mass would slowly accumulate on the sun because the mass of the sun would get would increase, the center would get hotter, the nuclear processes would be a little bit more active, the luminosity would go up and the star would expand. But there's another kind of garbage can here that if the mass instead falls on a degenerate object, in other words, a white dwarf or a neutron star, something else happens that a white dwarf isn't simply a star at the end of its life. It's so compact that for all practical purposes, its support doesn't depend on temperature. It's literally supported only by the, by the density. Now you can make this very complicated by talking about quantum effects. That's not, that's not necessary. It's sufficient to say that it's the same thing that would happen if you try to stuff, if you try to stuff enough people in a phone booth, and those things still exist somewhere, or you try to put a maximum number of people inside an SUV, eventually you're going to hit the limit where you can't stuff any more in there. That's the equivalent of a pressure gradient. So if you try to get more in there, if they were actually gravitationally supporting, the system would have to contract to generate enough pressure to counterbalance the gravity. That's the critical thing about this other kind of garbage heap, that if you dump mass onto a white dwarf, it starts to contract because the only way it can generate the internal pressure is by increasing its density. There's a limit to this. That's the Chandrasekhar limit. That if you have single stars, this is something that builds in the core during the life of the star. But in this case, you're doing it dynamically by having a source on the other side. Now, let's go to the example. Uh, this, this is the Roche surface, okay? This is um, a, a, a binary system. Uh, it, you, you can see that not only is there a white dwarf here, but it's, it's magnetized. You can see the little magnetic fields and the other star is kind of disintegrating and it's passing material through the Roche surface. I, I didn't make this one up. This is from a few years ago in Matera. It was a very, very good dessert. But the, the key here, and unfortunately, I don't seem to be able to show an arrow if I'm in this mode. So the only thing I can tell you is look at the contours that you're seeing here, because those are showing the equivalent of the gravitational limit. That is, a star inside of that can maintain its structure. And if it expands outside of that, some of that mass is going to be lost to the companion, and some of it is just going to be blown out of the system. Okay, so the question that presents itself as just a theoretical question is, if you have a white dwarf and you start dumping mass on it, what happens? Is this just going to accumulate to the point where the contraction of the star brings it into a critical state and it collapses and forms a type one supernova or something even more extreme? Or is this something that leads to another condition? And that is where this explosive business comes in. That's where we start talking about a classical nova. So 
the this is just to show you an example of um, the way that the extrusion occurs. So the stream is up, um, this, the stream is up here, and it's in this case it's driving the rotation of the sphere. But you can imagine that the sphere is the rotating white dwarf. This is a boundary layer that's coating the object. So you can imagine that somehow there's an accretion disk. And then there's this jet that you see coming over the object. So let's see if I can go backwards. So there's the incoming stream from the jet. So it's a great example of conservation of angular momentum, actually. Okay, so what's happening if this disk is actually mixing into the surface of the star is roughly the equivalent of a very, very strong wind blowing over the ocean, that you get the formation of breaking waves that take the material, in this case, the purple stuff that's in the disk and mixes it by engulfment into the envelope of the white dwarf. So something else that's happening is the stuff that's coming in is from a normal star. It has hydrogen and helium, but mainly hydrogen. And if that gets mixed into the underlying white dwarf, which is the remnant of what was once the core of a star, and so its composition is either very helium rich or very carbon rich or even oxygen rich because of the nuclear processes that took place in its previous lifetime. If you mix this hydrogen into that zone, you're doing the equivalent of a carburetor in a car. You're pre-mixing an explosive mixture because the hydrogen can react with the carbon and with the oxygen and initiate a nuclear reaction exactly as it would in the sun except here it's not in the interior it's not something that has it's not a zone that has a solar mass or 10 solar masses sitting on top of it this is almost literally at the stellar surface the reason it initiates the reactions is you just pile enough material on there and eventually it ignites um, the closest thing in a, in a chemical sense that you might be familiar with is a silo explosion in, in a grain silo that you can build up in the base of an accumulated layer if you don't properly ventilate it. <coughs> a layer <clears throat> that gets sufficiently hot by a combination of decay and compression that it reaches a critical temperature and goes through an explosive chemical reaction. In this case, what happens is you initiate a different kind of burning. Let me show you some, a simulation of that. Uh, to start on the left side. Okay, you, you've just heard as well as seen Pisa. Um, obviously, this is, a, this is a pile of wood. It's... Um, a wood stove and a pizzeria. But the thing that you're seeing is a chemical reaction that's producing convection, that is a buoyant, turbulent mixing. Air is being brought into this by engulfment, and the reaction that's producing the flame is an oxidation reaction that's being fueled by the reaction itself. That is, this is a runaway. It could go into a forest fire. It could go into a deflagration if you had enough wood in there. And what happens instead when the reaction initiates on the surface of the white dwarf is in this model shown with this being a couple hundred kilometers in depth. That's what the nuclear reactions look like. They generate now different compositions this isn't simply the same as the flame this actually has 
the products of nuclear reactions, nuclear synthesis mixing into the envelope. And over, over time, and by time here, I mean a few thousand seconds, something equivalent to the mass of Jupiter can be converted from carbon into oxygen or into oxygen 15, which is an unstable radioisotope. When that decays, it will release so much energy that the envelope of this white dwarf, the accumulated material gets blown off. Uh, this is the next example. The initiation of the reaction is here. If I can show this. No, it's not showing, I'm sorry. Um, it should. Okay. Um, yes, actually there it is. So, so I keep forgetting that the initial reaction occurs so slowly that you just have to be patient. But, but you see the start just produces some kind of bubbling. There's a little bit of mixing of the underlying material. This is later when it's gone into the full burn. So give it just for a moment and you'll see the increase in the reaction rate. This is a thermonuclear runaway. The amount of energy that's being released here is roughly the luminosity of the sun in a hundred years. This happens in a thousand seconds. And what you've done here is to convert all of the hydrogen here into oxygen and neon. And that material, again, is going to blow off the outer layers. Okay, this is what's called the classical nova. From a theoretical side, you start with the question of what happens if, and the what happens if is that you initiate reactions. The reactions occur so quickly, the energy release is virtually instantaneous as far as the life of the star is concerned, that this is the same as you would get if you take a chemical explosion in say a pile of dynamite and look at the fragments that result from it. This doesn't slowly blow off the wind. This doesn't simply re-expand. The envelope does expand a bit, but this mixing goes so quickly and the reaction goes so quickly that the envelope explosively is ejected. By that, I mean with velocities of a few thousand kilometers per second, and something in the neighborhood of, oh, about 10 to 100 Earth masses gets blown off. Now, what we don't know, and I'll get back to this in a moment, we don't know how much mass actually gets blown off. Theoretically, we can't calculate that. What I've shown you is the initiation. To do these calculations alone takes about a, oh, equivalent of, of 100,000 years of equivalent computer time, uh, this to cover about 1,000 seconds. But what we don't know is how this goes into the full dynamical stage. It's a lot different than blowing up a firecracker. <laughs> we, we can't watch this process and we can't build this in the laboratory. The thing that's driving this is a nuclear reaction. This is a fusion reaction in a strong gravitational field that's something like 100,000 times the gravitation of the Earth. So the next thing is what the signature is, and that's the classic definition of what we mean by a nova. It's a sudden brightening of the star, goes back to the term stella nova in uh, the 17th and 16th centuries. 
but it's a it's a brightening that lasts for anything from days to weeks, sometimes months. There are different photometric behaviors. These are this is a sort of classification scheme that purports to separate these into specific classes. The part that's important is the star brightens from a very, very faint precursor that the progenitor is something that sometimes we can actually observe. And it brightens by somewhere between a factor of a million and 10 million in the space of about a day. So the reason for that, to do this spectroscopically, the key to all of this is understanding that what we see in the visible is just a fraction of the story. That's why I started with the theoretical part. If you have a nuclear reaction and you don't have a full star on top of it, although the core of the sun, just to make a comment, is a temperature above 10 million degrees, the surface has a temperature of only about 6,000. You've got a whole sun between you and the core. And the result of the diffusion of energy out of the core produces a change in the energy density as you go out. And by the time you get to the surface, the surface is now so large that the radiation doesn't have to be hot to effectively relieve the star of this excess energy. But in this process, the initial expansion has temperatures that are well above 10,000 degrees. In fact, at maximum, it's probably closer to 100,000. And most of that energy is in the ultraviolet. We don't see it. We don't, in fact, see the actual explosion. We see something a bit later. But the clue to what's going on the reason suddenly this thing gets bright is because as it expands, this layer cools. And it, instead of simply cooling like something in a refrigerator, it cools as a gas and with an atomic composition that includes heavy metals. Just then to explain the point, this is referred to as the iron curtain. But the ultraviolet spectrum is predominantly lines of heavy metals that are neutral or perhaps slight, slightly ionized. That is ionized iron and twice ionized iron or manganese or titanium. These lines are spread through the ultraviolet. When the thing is hot, the envelope, this ejecta, is so ionized that these lines simply aren't there because the species aren't there. But as it's expanding, if it cools, it recombines. That is, it goes from being a highly ionized gas to an almost neutral gas and suddenly turns incredibly opaque. The first two spectra in this particular NOVA, it's the only time we've ever seen this. We got on this in about 10 hours of its discovery. And we got on it with the IUE satellite, which was an ultraviolet satellite. At first we saw light in the ultraviolet. Again, I can't use a pointer here, so it's difficult other than to say it's the top two panels. And then a day later, everything had recombined. The ultraviolet had literally disappeared and that, at that point, the NOVA went to optical maximum. The key to understanding what's going on is that unlike a supernova, where you're destroying the star and the luminosity is coming from radioactive decay inside the now destroyed star, the ejecta of the star, and from an expanding shock, inside the star and inside the ejecta. Here, the ejecta are just a screen. That is, it's like an expanding curtain, hence the name, 
that turns opaque and then turns transparent. And when it's opaque, that light that is being, in, that is irradiating it from the central object suddenly gets redistributed and you see it in the optical. And as it continues expanding and the UV becomes progressively less opaque, the peak of the radiation shifts back into the ultraviolet and the star decays. And so that's why you see at the beginning this very rapid rise and then this slow decline as the envelope becomes more transparent. The advantage of all this is that once you combine this phenomenology, this photometry and the spectroscopy, you have a way of literally stripping through the layers of this expanding medium. The, the, perhaps some of you know what planetary nebulae look like when you take different filter views of them. This is like a planetary nebula, except in fast forward, where the event of the nebula takes maybe 10 to the five years or 10,000 years here, the whole thing's over in the space of a couple of weeks. So the other thing is the central object. Once the ejecta become sufficiently clear, we can see it. And in this case, this is an, a light curve taken with the SWIFT satellite, with the uh, X-ray telescope. On the top, you see that there's an X-ray source there. This is a nova in uh, the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, Nova LMC 19, 1968, which was also seen in 1990 and was also seen a year ago. It's a recurrent Nova. But the thing that's important is in the top curve, you see that there's a very strong X ray source that lasts for about 100 days. And then it just goes away. On the bottom, you see the ultraviolet emission from this object. And that's the light curve that says what you see in the UV is also the central object. You don't see that in the optical because this light is being redistributed. The other thing you see is gamma rays. That's something very new. Uh, the first novae that were observed directly at energies of 100 megavolts or more, which is pretty bloody amazing. It's the same as you would see from extremely strong X-ray sources. This is the kind of emission you see from galactic nuclei. Um, in this case, it's just because there are internal shocks. You can accelerate particles by slamming them into other structures that are the result of the explosion. That's the explosion. Okay, in this case, it's fireworks, but it's basically the same thing. That you have a central object that blows the material out, it fragments, there's a component that's diffuse, and there are also these many fragments. And the thing that's important, please note this on this image, the fragments that are traveling farthest are the ones that were ejected with the highest initial speed. It's not that there's a gradient here. These aren't being pushed out. This is ballistic. So when you have fireworks, each piece comes off from the fragment of the explosion, from the fragmentation rather, with different initial speeds. It's kind of a cloud. But if it's roughly spherical at the beginning, it's going to stay roughly spherical because the buggers aren't bouncing into each other. They're actually running away from each other. Initially, they were colliding. Initially, there were internal shocks. You can hear that in the way the explosion sounds, that it has some, in, some structure in its acoustic emission. Now, in this case, this was one of the uh, celebrations in Pisa a few years ago. This explosion is only a couple of hundred meters across. And this is about, oh, half a minute after the explosion. 
Novi can reach ejections, eject the sizes that are fractions of a parsec and still be visible. That's the difference between something that's a kilogram and something that's uh, 10 Earth masses. And this is an example of, of ejecta. Um, the one on the left is the one I was showing you the initial stages of, that's Nova Cygni. These are H-alpha images that were taken three and five years after the explosion. The figure on the figure below it is the theoretical expectation based on modeling the line profile of what this should look like. The one on the right is the line profile that is seeing the spectrum. I'll ex try explaining that in a minute. And it, getting a prediction of what the shape of the ejector should be to produce that kind of line profile. Uh, the images on the bottom are actually the real thing, except those images were taken about four years after the prediction. So what I'm trying to, to get at here is the ejecta allow us infer to get information about the way the explosion occurred, the processes that drove the the ejection and the geometry. I hope this is making sense. Uh, this is the most recent NOVA. Um, it went off actually just last month and it's being followed by the two spot group and also uh, one of the members of the ARAS consortium, Sean Curry. Um, the line, just to show you what's going on, and again, it's, it's very annoying not being able to use a pointer. Uh, the axis is the velocity, the radial velocity in kilometers per second. The lines are the individual profile of neutral, neutral sodium covering a period of about a week. This is just to show you that what happens in the course of the explosion is the spectrum changes that you're looking at a gas that's expanding, its density is changing, its temperature is changing, its ionization is changing, and all of that is seen along your line of sight. Each piece is moving at a different velocity. So each part of this line profile is formed from a different place in the ejection. Okay, is there a question? Okay, so uh, on the bottom, there's a comparison of the four principal bomber lines in one profile, or sorry, at one time, just showing that you have in these lines, because they're formed in slightly different conditions, and slightly different depths in the ejecta, you have the basic structure, but they're not identical, because each one of them is biased to forming at a particular point in the ejecta. So the white is H alpha and the orange is H delta. And in looking at these, you were effectively stripping through the ejecta. Now, why you might want to know all of this is that the white dwarf in igniting this nuclear bomb doesn't completely or likely doesn't completely eject the material that's accumulated. It's not 100% efficient. It's possible that so much material has gotten excavated from the white dwarf that the explosion actually ports more mass off than accreted. But that's not the most likely outcome. Instead, it's more likely that there's some residual. And then in the next explosion, which may happen 10 years later or 10,000 years later, depending on the mass, this is gonna happen again. And so over time, one of the expectations is 
that the white dwarf is going to progressively grow in mass, eventually reaching the Chandrasekhar mass limit and collapse and go into a supernova. Now, that's a hope. It's a scenario, but it's one of the justifications for why we do this. The other is that if we understand how to analyze something so comparatively simple, we have a chance of understanding the analysis of the supernova type 2 or 1b or 1a. We have the chance to understand how to strip through the ejecta of much more violent events that ultimately have much more importance for the chemical evolution of the galaxy. Before going on, I should just explain one other thing that it isn't simply that the dwarf goes through this nuclear explosion. In a chemical reaction, you've got ash, you have residual, but it's the same, it's the same elements. Remember, this is nuclear. We're changing the, the actual elemental composition, not the chemical composition. So when this process has run its course and this stuff gets blown out, it pollutes the galaxy. This material is going to eventually wind up inside molecular clouds. It's going to get incorporated into protoplanetary disks. It's going to become part of the chemical, the, the, the chemical base of the galaxy. It's going to be in the mix. Now, we know this because there are grains picked up from meteorites that actually have the composition that we expect for that explosion, that have the isotopic signatures of this nuclear reaction. And these have been transported across the galaxy over the life of the galaxy. Now, this is a, tr a very, very minor contributor to the overall chemical mix of, of the elements. But if we understand something this simple, we're going to be able to understand something much more dramatic. So to not belabor the point because it, it'll be getting late for you. Um, one of the things that signals that we're seeing recombination is that different portions of the ejecta are at different densities. And the ones that cool the fastest are the first to recombine. Then you have a, a wave of recombination that moves out through the ejecta. And that's what drops this iron curtain. What you're seeing on the bottom is a model of the way this proceeds, that you have gas becoming opaque first in the inner portion where the density is higher, and then in the outer portion where the velocities are higher and the density is lower. The bottom is the model and the top is the actual example from a Nova explosion in 2011 that served as the clue. The absorption lines you're seeing are because you're looking directly at the object. Um, let me change screens for a moment here. Um, so to go back to the cartoon. Um, Okay. It's really much easier if I just draw cartoons instead of boring you with, with what I'm saying. So think of it this way. You have these ejecta here that are expanding from the central object. 
you're looking through here. The material at the outer part is going faster than the material in the inner part. And whatever is both shielded toward the central object and also this inner portion, which is going to be more opaque and is screening your view of the central object, you're looking at something that looks very much like an expanding atmosphere. It's an expanding surface. The outer portion has low density, but it's going to absorb and scatter this. And this outer stuff, which isn't seen against this surface, is going to be brighter. That is, you have light that's scattered and emitted in your line of sight. And then you have this surface, which is absorbing. And so this produces an absorption feature that is at blue shift. And this material produces emission of all sorts, but specifically, most of it is red shifted. And so when you put the two of them together, you have a profile that looks like that. Now, this is all sometimes referred to, if this is the radial velocity, as a P Cygni profile because it looks like the lines in the star P Cygni. But the thing that is important is that it's an indication that you've got a moving surface that has an atmosphere above it that's absorbing and also emitting. And as this expands, the relative fraction that's emitting becomes progressively larger relative to this very small central object. And the result is the line goes over into emission. You simply lose the absorption. Now, that allows you to say that the absorption comes from different depths. And so if you see, for example, like I was showing you on this feature. Can you see this? Or do I have to switch the screen again? Steve, we're seeing half of your drawing. Okay, so um, if you see the line looking like this, then this, again, this is velocity. This is a fragment that happens to be lying in your line of sight. And then if sometime later you see the fragment here, it's because this happens to be another portion of the ejecta that's now thick, and this part it may have disappeared. Okay? They may have different compositions. They may have different densities. This is the record frozen in the expansion of what happened during the explosion. That is the reason for everything else that I'm going to be quickly talking about here to put the rest of this in perspective. So now going back to the slides, this is what I was talking about. These are individual fragments that happen at that moment to be recombining. And as the wave moves out, fragments in farther out portions of the ejecta show up in absorption. And eventually, the line turns over into emission because it's expanded far enough. So now going back to now, there's one other thing that can happen, which is where amateur observations are so tremendously important. These are real-time phenomena, okay? All explosions have to be followed because they're dynamical, very densely. It's very hard to get telescope time at, say, VLT to sit on an object like this one, which 
is known as um, Assassin 17HX. Uh, this was an event that took a couple of hundred days. The chance that you would get more than a dozen hours on VLT to observe this object is virtually zero. The existing spectra that were taken with VLT and with X shooter are shown here with the green on the top curve. And the couple of spectra that were taken hundreds of days later. All of the information that we have about what happened during this event spectroscopically comes from amateurs. And these curves are from the AAVSO. Without these, these dynamical events literally couldn't be studied. So what this showed was that the central object, the thing that's illuminating this ejecta was varying. Sometimes it was brighter and sometimes fainter. When brighter, it was cooler. When fainter, it was hotter. You have something that's expanding and contracting, likely because there's an unstable nuclear reactor underneath all of this. That is the residual on the white dwarf. The part that perhaps, well, I find is the most beautiful piece of physics. You have this wave of ionization and recombination. When the star is bright in the optical, it's because it's completely opaque in the UV. All of the light is now coming out in the optical. If the central object gets hotter, the UV ionizes. All of the light now shifts away from the optical and the whole spectrum changes. That's what happened in the course of time. These are different transitions of the hydrogen lines and the iron lines and helium are shifting back and forth. When the star is bright, you, you see absorption. When the star is faint, you see emission. When it's bright, it's low ionization. When it's faint, it's high ionization. That's telling you that the central source is changing its effective temperature, not just its luminosity. And that says that on that white dwarf, something is still burning. The only way that can happen is if there was some hydrogenic material left behind. Some of the accumulated mass has to have mixed very deeply and it's still residual in, it's still burning. And this is after hundreds of days. Normally these things turn off after no more than a couple of months. And this one stayed active for about two thirds of a year. That this is universal. This is showing one line transition. It's my favorite iron two line. Uh, what you're seeing in these absorption features are fragments. This is what's telling you that you're looking at something that looks like that fireworks explosion. In the in the explosive event, they're not the same. Each one has a different distribution. They have sort of a maximum velocity in common, but the individual structures show that there's extended gas and emission, and then it's fragmented. That's the explanation. If you're looking through the ejecta, you can say, okay, what would you expect if you had fragmented ejecta? What would it look like? This is what it looks like. The individual fragments, if they're, are, if they're numerous enough, just form a continuous structure. And because they're ballistic, that structure doesn't change. It just stretches in space. But these don't change their velocity. That's the whole point of ballistic motion. This isn't the wind. The reason for mentioning that is that they can be identified each fragment here, and that's what makes this unique, has a different composition. And we can actually tell that. 
we can compare not only the mass of the fragments, but their width in velocity tells us how they're expanding, how they're being stretched out by the expansion. And as they change in their opacity, the strengths of these lines also changes. The other thing that's now clear is that the difference, each one of these on the left is a different nova. It's the same line, but in different explosions. On the right is a theoretical model. The thing that's different between them is essentially the angle with which you're viewing this. That is, when this blows out, it doesn't blow out as a sphere, it blows out as bubbles, as if you want something axisymmetric. It blows out like a cylinder. And you look at a cylinder in different angles, and it looks different. So if you have something that's bipolar, which we now know is characteristic also of planetaries, if this doesn't blow off a spherical shell, but it's already distorted, what you get on the right are the predictions of the profiles for different orientations, and each one of those matches the one on the left, which is the real thing. So we can see spatial structure, we can see internal structure, we can get the composition, and we can compare each of these novi, not uniquely because each one of them is interesting, but to get the global picture of how this explosion occurs, to get past the individuality by studying intensely individual systems, learning how to interpret their spectra, and then going ahead and looking at ensembles. Uh, this is, frankly, I think, the most important result that's come out of any of the theses we've had here. Uh, these are four novi, very different times, all from the same composition of white dwarf, all seen at the same stage in the expansion. I th think you'll agree they're pretty damn close to each other. These are the only four that have ever been observed in the ultraviolet. That's why we called them the FAP4. There's actually a way for Yvonne, one of my students, to, to learn something about Anglo-American culture because he didn't know that was what the Beatles were called. Uh, but we didn't want to get into copyright problems with, with Apple Records or Sony. So we couldn't call this the Beatles. Anyway, the lines that you're seeing here are strong lines of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and basically nothing else. The line widths are about 5,000 kilometers per second, and these are all at exactly the same stage after the outburst. If they really are such clones of each other, it means that once we've understood deeply a few of them, We'll be able to understand the whole class and understand how this explosion actually proceeds. The last thing is um, that in this in the process, something else happens in in the cooling. These form dust. Just to explain one thing quickly, we know that, that a substantial component of the interstellar medium is in some kind of almost solid state that we call dust grains. We, we see them in meteorites. We know that they're present in protoplanetary disks. We know that they form a major portion of the regions in which star formation occurs. We don't know how this stuff forms. We know that we can't form this solid phase in the interstellar medium. It's got to get cooked somehow in stellar atmospheres and then get blown out. But 
we can't simulate in the laboratory the conditions that you have in the envelopes of stars. We don't get to those kinds of density and temperature regimes. One of the things NOVI do, some of them, is go through a dust forming episode. Now, one way you know this is that the infrared suddenly increases in luminosity because dust formed at large distance and irradiated never reaches a high temperature. And when it re-radiates, it does so in the infrared. The other characteristic is that if you form dust in these ejecta, it's like a smog. You lose part of the line profile, and that's what you're seeing here. These are two novae that form dust. The light curve is on the left. That big dip is when they went through a sudden dust forming event. In it, the way you can look at this is 1% of the ejecta suddenly condensed out. In the space of about seven days, the star dropped by something like eight magnitudes. In extreme events, even supernovae, that can be even more. One event, a merger of a star in which an enormous amount of dust was created in the ejecta. Dropped 16 magnitudes and it still hasn't recovered. Normally, this would be a curiosity, but here it actually is a laboratory because everything else I've been telling you is that we can understand the structure of the ejecta. We know the density distribution. We know the ionization state. It's a passive medium. So it's like setting up a vial of gas in the laboratory, closing it, and then changing its temperature. We can actually watch the event looking in different wavelength regions and see what the composition of the grain is, as well as its temperature. We know when it's formed. We know where it's formed because we can see different portions of the line profile cut off. That's here. The top shows what happens as the dust forms. You go from a symmetric profile to one where you only see the stuff near you. Again, it's like a fog. You see the stuff that's in front of or less absorbed by the dust. But the part that you're seeing through that medium, in other words, the rear material, you lose, and the profile becomes asymmetric. Uh, the bottom is the example of the light curve on the on its side. The what you see in the green and red is the normal phase and the beginning of the expansion. The Black is exactly the same star, except when the dust is formed. It's difficult to believe that from the spectrum, but if you scale the black up, they're virtually identical, which says that the dust is only a screen. It literally is a fog. That it forms so quickly, that it forms at a particular stage, that it forms in a particular composition, all of feeds back into our understanding of how this phase of the interstellar medium was formed. So just, this is literally stripping through the, the ejecta. Each one of these transitions has a different ionization requiring a different energy, but there's a systematic. This is one nova seen through different ions. Each ion produces a bias in where it's formed within the ejecta that's very specific. Between those, we can get the ejecta structure. Um, I was going to use one other example, but maybe this is going a little bit too far. Um, everything I've described is an explosion that occurs in a vacuum. We just have the ejecta lifted They've fragmented because of internal processes at the start. But after that, they're just in free expansion. But there's a class of stars, symbiotics, 
so named because you have a white dwarf and a red giant in the same system, and the red giant wind completely covers the white dwarf. So it looks like the dwarf is sitting as the kind of symbiotic ecological relation with the giant. This same process occurs on that white dwarf. The explosion is now no longer free. It's a shockwave that's moving into the atmosphere. And again, we can see this. The white is the H alpha line before the explosion of one of these systems. This is RSO Fiyuki, which is a white dwarf inside the wind of a red giant. The white dwarf simply formed an ionized region originally. It looked like the Orion Nebula, that you had a central star and then around it, you had a region ionized and then the larger wind of the giant, which was neutral. In the space of three days in uh, 2021, something happened on the white dwarf and it exploded. Uh, this, it went through this, it, this runaway. It went through an explosive event. It blew off the envelope, but this time the envelope was forming a totally different spectrum. This shows you that from the wings, this thing was expanding at 4,000 kilometers per second. Okay, it's not a supernova, but it's a pretty damn good nova. Um, these are the X-ray light curves. It's probably better not to go through all of this, other than to say that, yes, you see the white dwarf. This is the same thing I was showing you from the other novae. This, the post-explosion has a temperature of 10 million degrees. This is what happens. You have the top curve, which is the X-ray source, and shows you that there was burning going on, and this broad change, the red to the gray, is the expansion of the shock. At 4,000 kilometers per second, the shock is almost as hot as the nuclear source. It's just, it's cooling much more rapidly. So that's what the explosion looks like theoretically. That is, it takes place on the left side on the white dwarf, the right side is the red giant, and this is the expansion of the shell. First at about 20 days, which is the top, and then the bottom, which is where it's actually now much larger than the size of the system. The whole system that you see on the top fits into that red dot on the bottom. Um, this is what the explosion effectively looks like, that you have a shock wave, there's an ionized region, or a better way of putting it is, it's this. This is not what a classical novel looks like. This is what one of these symbiotic types look like. Why this has suddenly turned important is that we now know that surrounding supernovae, there's an environment from the previous stages of the star's life. And sometimes specialists don't talk to each other. Those who have been doing supernovae for the last 15 years have suddenly discovered that they actually look very much like these symbiotic objects. The bottom is the Trinity test. The top is um, one of the atmosphere tests. The fireball is what I was talking about that cools. The structure that you see there are regions that have different temperatures and consequently different densities. The expansion is supersonic. It's so supersonic that at the beginning, it doesn't know that the atmosphere is there. You're seeing pure fireball. But once that cools, then on the bottom, you get the phenomenon called breakout, which is that color that you see, that frill around the base. That's the shock wave that continues while the interior fireball cools. Again, that's the actual Nova event as we see it. So 
I hope this has made some sense. It's really a way, I hope, of encouraging you to see that very simple observations, just a few spectra taken over, taken systematically during one of these events allows you to do an enormous amount of physics that understanding these allows you an excuse to think about all sorts of really neat processes, I think. Uh, nuclear processing under ex explosive conditions, um, supersonic expansions, the shaping of nuclear charges. If you want to get bloodthirsty, uh, radiative processes, spectral diagnostics that work on everything from thermonuclear react thermonuclear fusion reactors being developed on Earth to the interior of the sun. I guess I should also mention that this is the same thing that happens in the transition between the red giant and the later stages of evolution of a star like the sun. That at the final stage of the red giant branch, in other words, when a star has expanded to its maximum radius and its core has reached its maximum temperature in that expansion, there's a, an ignition of helium that takes place under the identical conditions to what I was talking about. It's effectively helium igniting under degenerate conditions inside the star. We don't know how that reacts. We don't understand how the turbulent mixing occurs. We don't understand how the mixing into the rest of the star occurs. We see it, we have ideas about it, but these explosions allow us to study that in the raw, in real time, with all of these different diagnostic tools. And all of this, at least everything above the atmospheric cutoff, is accessible to backyard observations. Well, it takes as a spectrograph or a photometer, and you can actually do some genuine science for yourself to the point where you're looking at a phenomenon that is bound to bring questions to your mind. So I think it's probably best that I stop there. I hope there are questions and that I haven't overwhelmed you. Uh, it's very easy to get lost in, in the details, but the big picture is that this gives you a chance to see something that involves virtually all of astrophysical reasoning. It, it's not unique. It's just cute. <laughs> so I'll stop there. And thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bob, you've got a question. No, but I'd like to say thank you. Let me, let me pass the microphone. That's something I agreed to do. Steve, Steve this is Bob Buckheim. I think that was wonderful. I learned a lot. I, don't, I can't form a coherent question, but the way you related a whole lot of phenomena, the expanding shell, the spectral lines, and, and the, the helium flash, that was fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wow, thank you, Bob. Of course, we, we planted Bob here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to. Uh, Any other questions, questions in the room? Oh. Um, I answer emails. So if anybody wants, if there's anything I can clear up or at any rate, if you've got any questions, um, just write. It, it would be a pleasure. Okay, Steve, again, thank you. We appreciate it. We do have some equipment rental and equipment sales. Um, and this is something that is new.
Uh, if you look at the very bottom of our homepage, on the very first page, you can subscribe to EVAC Announce. So if you're a visitor and you haven't done that, it would be great. Uh, and then at the very bottom, you can get access to used equipment and equipment to rent. So we would like to just point that out. Also, James is and some others are going to be going out to picket posts tomorrow night. Uh, so if you would sign up to the uh, EVAC announce, you'll get some information. Or if you would sign up to az-observing at group, uh, groups.io.io, uh, and we can give you that information too. But that is also a group of people who are from up various clubs across Arizona that do observing as well. Um, anything else tonight? Next meeting, June 16th. Uh, it would help if you could assist us with uh, carefully stacking the chairs, uh, not too high on either one of those racks, or help us to take down tables. Thanks again to the people who participated in the uh, swap meet. Uh, welcome to all of our visitors. Bye.